Good afternoon. Um, London is probably one of the most written about, imagined, inscribed cities um, in the history of literature. Um, and, and I'm wondering, is it, um, is, is, there, is there a sense of uh, uh, um, difficulty when one sort of approaches writing about London, a city that's sort of so many other people have tried to imagine and try to put onto the page? Um, Amit, would you like to start? Um, you know, I, 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 I was never a great reader of literature about London, so I was unburdened by that kind of whole, that baggage. Um, in fact, I had trouble thinking of London as a place, in the sense that place became important to me, uh, through my simultaneously rediscovery or discovery in London, as it were, as it happened. In, uh, when I was an undergraduate there in, in the early 80s. Rediscovery of Calcutta, my memories of Calcutta City in which I didn't grow up, but which I used to visit, um, which seemed to be steeped in the ethos of place in comparison to the London that I was then inhabiting, uh, but also the literature that opened out onto place for me, which came to me through a kind of provincial literature uh, the, the, the literature of the Irish, the Irish moderns, Joyce, uh, New Zealanders who had migrated to London and begun to write about New Zealand, like Catherine Mansfield. So I'm talking about the early 80s and my reading there, which led me to discover place and my kind of affinity uh, uh, for it. London was kind of the antithesis of that, uh, the, the, for many reasons because I wasn't engaging with England or London. And it was to me a non-place. It was a place which, where I had to be because I was studying there. And um, it's only much, much later that I began to become not only aware of its internal differences, its, its streets, its neighborhoods, of, of, of the city as being also part of, you know, uh, a tradition which sees the metropolis not only as the center of things, but full of peripheries of surprises. I became aware of that much later, and then would become aware of the interest in the literature which, which explored that, that, that inner kind of, um, in, a, in a, I won't say conflict, but, but a multiplicity of London much later. Uh, so so I, I, I mean, I wasn't overly sort of uh, anxious or, burdened by representations of London uh, when, when I began to think about writing this book. Uh, 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 Farouk, um, how, how, how did you come to writing about London or, or, or thinking about London or, or sort of dreaming about London on the page? Uh, okay. uh, you know, the, the, uh, unlike uh, Amit, uh, I had read about London mainly through its greatest exponent, Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens' novels are placed in Victorian London, and, well, most of them. Uh, and they spoke to me of the greatest human tragedy, comedy, characterization, and so forth. I never thought, though, that I would write about London at all. Uh, it's, it's a fact that uh, writers who want to be writers look for material, but you have to find your material. But mostly what happens, I think, is from my own experience, is that your material finds you. And what happened to me was uh, I went to uh, Cambridge on a scholarship. Uh, I stayed behind after Cambridge in London because that was the place to go. There was, there was nothing to do in Cambridge to get jobs. And I had nowhere to return to in India. I didn't have an ancestral home. My father had migrated as a professional immigrant labor to Persia, to Iran to do some engineering. He died there. There was no home to go back to. And love and politics kept me in London. I joined immigrant groups, one of them the Indian Workers Association, and moved on from there to join a, a, an, an agitational propaganda outfit 
called the Black Panther Movement. And being in that, we used to run a newspaper called Freedom News. And uh, we used to write all sorts of Marxist and Leninist diatribe in the newspaper, trying to convert people to revolutionary politics. And one day, a very wise man, uh, Mr. C.L.R. James, a Trinidadian philosopher, Marxist, and cricket commentator, basically, um, he came to speak to us and he said, why are you writing all this nonsense? Uh, what, what do you guys do? Uh, and somebody says, I'm a bus conductor. He said, why don't you write about what happens in the garage in, in London? And somebody else said, I'm unemployed. He said, what happens at the unemployment exchange? And then he turns to me and says, what do you do? And I said, I'm a school teacher. So he said, why don't you write about what happens in your schools? And it immediately, that changed our editorial policy. And we began to write about uh, little things that happened in school. A black girl was accused of stealing somebody's pen. There was a fight in the playground. Somebody threw a bench at the art teacher. Uh, the fifth form disco got disrupted by black boys from Brixton who came and raided the place over jealousy over some girl and the whole place got closed down. So I used to write these 500 uh, uh, word essays anonymously. One day after about 20 of these editions, a fellow in a three-piece suit comes to my school and uh, asks the people, where is Mr. Dhondi? He says, he's in the staff room. The fellow comes up and he says, are you Farooq Dhondi? And I said, do I owe you money or are you from the police? And uh, he said, no, I'm a publisher. And I read your short stories and stuff. And I said, how do you know they're my short stories? He says, the guy who sells me the paper told me. And can I publish them? And I said, um, those are only 500 words, short stories. I am Scott Fitzgerald, I'm Hemingway, you know? Uh, I could write better stuff than that. And he said, well, try it. So what he said to me most significantly was, there is no multicultural literature in Britain, and Britain is waiting. There is a ready audience for writing about people who come from abroad and are living in London. And at the time, through the agitational propaganda work I was doing, I was working with the Bangladeshi, mainly Silheti community, in the east end of London, uh, squatting houses for them, fighting racism um, attacks, this, that, and the other. And I thought I'd made friends with a lot of them, and they were working, most of the young men were working in the in the uh, garment trade, leather and this and that. And so I wrote about what I knew of them. And one of the stories was called Come to Mecca. And what happens is that these young boys are working in the garment factory and some political, white political agitators come to them. And uh, this young woman, uh, excites them into doing a strike and getting more money and so on and so forth. And then um, one of the boys is quite fancies the girl and he says to her, will you come to Mecca with me? And she thinks he means Saudi Arabia. What he means is Mecca dancing. <laughs> it's a dance hall. And uh, she refuses to go to Saudi Arabia, but uh, without realizing quite what he's after. And that's the sort of the, the crux of the story. It was published, uh, published East End at your feet and then come to Mecca. And once you publish one book, they want another of the same sort. So you write about London. I published about four or five books set in London. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, uh, Mike, Micah, um, how, you've been in London, I think you said for the last 18 years, right? 30. Oh, 30, sorry. <laughs> uh, um, how did you come, you know, you coming into London, entering London, um, and, then, and then deciding to, to use that as a subject uh, and, and sort of placing yourself imaginatively in that city? What, what was a little bit of that process like for you? Um, well, I'm just referring to, uh, um, to my, uh, what um, Farouk and um, Ami have said before. Uh, what becomes apparent, actually, listening to them, is that I think London, um, 
to put it negatively is a huge mess. To put it positively is a fantastic energetic melting point, a uh, melting pot really. And unlike a city like Paris, you don't even, so Paris is often referred to as she, as a woman. Now, we were just briefly talking earlier, is, is London referred to as, is, is, it ma as a, is it a man or a woman? It's a beast. I think that was the best explanation we came up with. It's a big, big beast in a positive and negative sense. And actually, you can do with London and in London whatever you want. I haven't experienced, I lived in Paris for two and a half years. I lived in uh, Alexandria in Egypt for uh, a couple of years. I lived in other cities and uh, I've never experienced um, such an energetic place as, as London. So I think in London, you, literally, you can become whatever you want if you put the energy in it. So as a writer, I never made the decision of I want to write about London because I don't actually know if you want to write about something, you almost need to have a sort of shape. What's interesting is that, of course, I live in London. And so when I was um, writing, setting out to write a book a, about uh, a, a woman, uh, in my, uh, at, you know, a woman in her late 40s as myself, uh, I mentioned her in London. And then I realized that what London offers is, um, so I think the most, one of the most exciting things about London is also from the landscape point of view, is that you have the traffic, the, uh, you know, the sort of uh, cosmopolitan stuff, but you also have nature that it coexists in London really quite next to each other. And if you want to send your characters out into the wild, you only need to send them out onto the heath, uh, the Hampstead Heath, which is a huge park in the north of London. And one of my most favorite places in London is actually on the heath. There are three ponds, na uh, natural ponds, and there are swimming ponds, uh, a woman's pond, a men's pond, and a mixed pond. And I love swimming in, in the woman's pond. So it was natural for me to also send my character, or one of my characters, there. If I wanted my character to link to their unconscious, that was, uh, you know, it's a vibrant, uh, symbolic place to send them to. Thank you. Um, one, one of the ways that sort of, you know, I know you live in the city and, wrote, and write about it, and Farouk, uh, you live in the city and, and write about it. I, I'm not sure, I'm, I mean, did you, have you been living in London when you've been writing about it? No, so ha, and I know that sort of, you know, Joy spoke about the fact that sort of to write, writing about a place um, that you are sort of distant from is, for him, was the only way of doing it, sort of to, to imagine that place. Um, he imagined Dublin when he was living in Paris and when he was living in, in Trieste. Uh, um, did you feel that sort of gave you a sense of mastery or ability over that city that living in that city w wouldn't have given you? Um, I, I, I don't know. I, um, mm -hmm. I mean, London itself gave me perspective on what I wanted to write because it was so, my experience of London was so unlike everything I loved. Um, uh, uh, you know, I was so miserable in London <laughs> in the in the early '80s when I spent those three three years there. Uh, w what years were those? Uh, 1983 to 1986. Yeah, miserable years. Yes. Uh, 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 well, firstly, well, I, I I first visited London in 1973, mm -hmm. uh, and already became aware of well at the, well there was a kind of there was a kind of journey that London and England. Uh, Britain were on. In 1973, from my perspective, so I was just kind of um, seeing for the first time a London in which, which was just emerging out of that whole psychedelia, ca Carnaby Street on the one hand, Indian gurus on the other, and the National Front on yet another uh, kind of emerging out of that. And I, I became aware of new sort of Mm. A, a new strategic uh, 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 relations in a way that I hadn't before. That you know that um, strategically, uh, the the the, the so-called Asians al aligned themselves with the blacks or even called themselves black, but on the other hand, they didn't really get on with each other. And, and that black culture seemed to have more in common with white culture, which had very little in common with 
uh, with Asian culture. And, and there was this I was encountering as an 11 year old. Then I, I, I think I probably went there a couple more times in the 70s and, and England was seriously on the verge of becoming a proper European third world country. Uh, and, and also these other things, these, I, I was noticing, um, I, was, I kept being told, central heating has come to France. You know, the British uh, the, the has still haven't brought in central heating. They're still putting coins in those kind of yeah. electric meters, which they continue to do into the 90s, actually, in some places. Um, cold toilet seats, you know? That was, a, that was the other discovery about <laughs> London in the 70s. Um, so, so, you know, and then, couldn't quite make out what the connection was with India, you know, because there were these kind of Victorian houses which, which, uh, which somehow represented this dual Victorian puritanical uh, worldview, which uh, much later, only much later would I begin to understand in a way the appeal of those houses. But at that time, I was looking at something that looked kind of punitive in a way. And uh, on the other hand, I mean, they had, they had colonized India. Where, where were the cu cultural connections? I couldn't. There seemed to be more of a connection with Europe in certain ways between India and Europe than with uh, uh, with, with Britain. So I sort of figured all, uh, figure out all these things. Now, with, by the early 80s, we were into Thatcher's era, um, and and there was a contradiction going on there. On the one hand, they were doing these virginity tests on 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 spouses who were joining, you know, the women who were joining there, the men who lived in Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if, they, if they weren't virgins, they, then they couldn't be proper Hindu spouses. They were f f fake, you know, they were coming in. As, you know, so all that was going on. On the other hand, Thatcher was mm, very pro-entrepreneurship. Uh, and, and, and that was allowing the, the, the Asian shopkeepers to keep their kind of shops open on Sundays and bring to uh, the most moribund day I've ever known uh, in, 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 in humanity, the English Sunday was, br was bringing to it a, a kind of hint of life, which then would change later into shops generally remaining open on, on Sundays in, in, in Britain. So now, that was the London I was feeling absolutely you know, alienated from. Uh, so it actually gave me a kind of perspective on, on everything I then associated with India, which is not, which is not people in turbans or elephants, but a different kind of city air and light and noise, which I wasn't able to engage with in London, I would find that I was getting a perspective on that when I was in London in the early 80s. Uh, and understand my material was not so much India, but a certain kind of city. Uh, that could be in Europe, but it happened to be in India, Calcutta, Bombay, or whatever. So um, as, as far as London is concerned, it's changed a lot. And that gives you a perspective. That gives you the distance that you're talking about. And to write about the early 80s as I've done in Odysseus Abroad now, to see the fallout of th that Thatcherite legacy, where the kind of stuff that Farouk is talking about, you know, that the workers, the strikes, and all of that have become a thing of the past. To see, uh, you know, the, the, the you know, that's the London I gradually began to understand through Ealing films. You know, the older, uh, older London of the 50s, the 40s. Uh, those were wonderful education what London was. But under Thatcher, into the 90s, in, in, the, in the world of Tony Blair and later, the, it had gone. You know, uh, the, the, the world I encountered in the 70s, and which I also refer to here, in Hampstead and in Belsize Park, a bohemian world, had turned into the world of the super rich. That's the London we, we live in now. It's the London of the main super rich. That anyway gives you that distance you're talking about, I think, uh, especially when I'm writing about the early 80s. I, I, suspect, I suspect that that, that London no longer exists. It's as if that no, city has been I mean, sort of wiped man living in map. a bed sit over there yeah. like a tramp, although he earns a lot of money. I don't, I don't know, how, in Belsize Park, I don't know how many people are doing that anymore, you know? Yeah, mm, Mike. Um, what, what, I, what I'm picking up from, from your talk is how easy it is to fantasize about the London, uh, you know, the London of the 1940s or 50s, as you were referring to, and which apparently no longer exists. Uh, and again, does. actually, that, that points to something 
um, very positive in London because it, it continuously develops. Because I'm not sure that London in the 1940s and 50s were so glorious either. But of course it was different. And it's continued. I arrived in 86 and I totally <laughs> agree with Amit that uh, uh, the 80s were pretty dire in, in London. I remember walking, uh, I was working in a, in, a, in a shop in the center of London as a shop assistant and I was walking along the streets in one of my first uh, lunch breaks and I wanted to find a coffee shop I just wanted a coffee and I couldn't find a single coffee shop. And so after about three quarters of an hour, uh, when I only had 15 minutes left of my lunch break, I ended up in McDonald's. And I just thought, this is a mega city and I can't find a coffee shop. Now, as we know, this has all changed. Now you have Starbucks after Starbucks. Um, but it takes, I, I, somebody once said to me, and that's true to me, for me, and I've heard also from other people, that it takes seven years to fall in love with London, and seven, uh, exactly seven. <laughs> and if you, um, and, uh, and that was, I, I, it was an absolute love-hate and more hate than love relationship I had with London for the first seven years. Because it is incredibly hard when you arrive as a very young, you know, young person there, you live in shitty places, uh, you, you never have enough money um, to do anything really. Um, but it offers opportunities, but, and, but you have to put the energy into it. And if you stay seven years, uh, and for me, that was a tipping point. I mean, it, it helped eventually that I married an Englishman. That rooted me in, in London. Um, but there is that you have to battle with London, certainly. It Mar doesn't... Marriage helped. It yeah. helped you sort of... Well, to an Englishman. Exactly. Yeah, to an Englishman. Yeah, and it helps anyway to settle, you know. Um, but... Um, but it was more to do with uh, uh, the point I'm trying to make is you have to battle with London. You know, it doesn't welcome you and, you know, stroke your head. Did you want to add something? Yeah. Well, when I was asked to join this panel, I began to wonder what it was all about. <laughs> because uh, uh, I, I think I've come to some kind of conclusion about what I, what I should say. Um, so... Uh, I'm just counting that out of the maybe 23, 25 books I've written, about five of them are not to do with London. The rest of them are sort of set, but they're not to do with the landscape of London, nothing to do with Hampstead Heath or Belsize Park. Uh, they are much more to do with the agitational life that I've lived there. My last, one of my last books called London Company, is actually about uh, living, loving, falling in love, falling out of love, uh, the, the trials of that, and the agitational life that one lived in fringe politics, you know, demonstrating outside uh, courthouses, uh, being thrown into police stations, uh, that sort of life in London. And mostly, it really deals with the new London. And by the new London, I mean the post, uh, the, the post colonial migration of Bangladeshis, Sikhs, Pakistanis to the metropolis. Now they make up possibly 35 to 40 percent of that metropolis. And that's the London and the development of that London, which I've written about, not only in uh, uh, books, but in, the, uh, in BBC drama series and so forth, uh, if anybody is interested in, sorry to advertise it, uh, in a drama series on BBC, which I wrote called King of the Ghetto, it's about Bangladeshis in London about that Sileti community within which I worked, you can find it free on YouTube. It's a four-part series called King of the Ghetto with Zia Moyuddin and Tim Roth and... You know, you know, I was in London earlier this year for a while and one thing that struck me was that in central London, it, there seemed to be almost no South Asians at all. I, I, I would wander around and I would, I would not meet a South Asian or very, very few. Russians, and then, and then, Arabs, and rich Indians. Yes, yeah. And then, but then on the outskirts, I was wondering what it was that sort of kept 
Uh, or do you have any ideas of what it what is that keeps um, South Asian sort of like like this sort of this wall surrounding Central London that they they don't want to cross and don't want to enter, um, or is or, or is that your sense of it? When there was a an, an mass immigration to London and to Britain uh, from the ex colonies, from Bangladesh, from or then East Pakistan, from Pakistan, from India, uh, from the West Indies, they did not have any social policy for immigration in Britain. They formed absolutely no social policy and allowed people to the freedom to come and go where they wanted. What happened basically is that the Sikhs and Punjabis settled in South Hall. The Gujaratis and um, uh, Gujarati basically Asians from Kenya and, and uh, Uganda, maybe. Uganda turned up and lived in Wembley and uh, the Muslims, Bangladeshis and Pakistanis, I'm sorry about this damn thing. Um, they moved to Tooting and certain places. And if you, uh, that's, that's agitating, sorry. Uh, they moved to particular places and that's why they formed ghettos. And in the north, if you're not talking about London, if you're talking about Bradford or Dewsbury or Manchester or Birmingham, they lived around the mills in which they worked, the workers. And they formed communities which are completely isolated from, uh, from, um, shall we say, the mainstream of Britain. And that's why there's, uh, they breed some fundamentalism because their, uh, their prayer places are isolated, their madrasas are isolated, their schools are 99% uh, either Pakistani or Gujarati or whatever. And uh, it's, it's the failure of social policy in, on the part of the early governments of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and um, I think it's going to get it's going to get worse in that respect. The isolation is going to increase, even though there are moves now to try and integrate the areas. It's not going to happen. The, the you know the Sikhs are going to stay in South Hall. Yeah. Uh, can I re uh, yes. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm more positive uh, about this, I have to say. And um, of course, I'm speaking, I'm, what I'm aware of, I'm speaking as, as a Londoner over the last 30 years, but I'm of course speaking also as a white Caucasian Londoner. Um, but what I find actually very exciting, yes, everyone lives in their own little ghettos. And I could say I also live in my own little ghetto. I live in North London, uh, where there are a lot of um, white, middle class, artistic, creative people. So I found my little community where I feel you know, comfortable in. And I think that's what everyone does in London. But there's also a lot of um, crossover at work. The workplaces, for example, are a you know, where, where uh, each, co where the communities and different religion mix and just have to get on and they get on. And I actually think London is an incredible example of how, the, for the capability of us humans to coexist and yeah, make it somehow work. It's not perfect, totally not perfect, but then it's, it, it can never be perfect. Can I, can I say something about that? Um, Recently, and it might interest this audience more than another, uh, the, there was an incident uh, of uh, political manipulation in the east end of London, in the borough of Tower Hamlets, where a gentleman called Lutfur Rehman, a uh, Bangladeshi, appealed to the rest of the Bangladeshis on religious grounds, paid money by the mosques, which are funded by Saudi Arabia, uh, by little, uh, what do you call it, uh, TV stations that are run within the community of Tower Hamlets, he got to be the mayor of Tower Hamlets. And he was recently removed by a central government commission which found him guilty of gross corruption, of using the council's money, Tower Hamlets council's money to, uh, to fund organizations of a pseudo-fundamentalist nature and then getting them to get the rest of the community to vote either by threat or by coercion or by saying, if you don't vote for me, you're not Islamic and, and so on. And he was removed from that office and um, 
another Labour Party <coughs> member was uh, elected, that again the Bangladeshi uh, population of Tower Hamlets has uh, elected Roshnara of the Labour Party, one of their own, which is great, uh, a young woman, uh, educated in England, probably born in England, I think, and uh, she's part of the Labour Party um, select elite and a favourite of Jeremy Corbyn. So, so let's see, we might have a Bangladeshi minister in the next government. <laughs> that, that, would be, that would be nice. Uh, um, just going back to books, uh, uh, do, do any of you have favourite or cherished books about London? Peter Ackroyd's London. Oh, the big fat. The biography. big fat. Uh, it's it's a beautiful um, biography of London, actually, where Peter Ackroyd is a, is a very famous um, journalist and writer, and he that that actually that is one of the books which made me feel uh, I arrived in London. Uh, you can read it and and walk. He he explains you know how London has organically grown, and you suddenly realize. Um, uh, where, so for example, where there are roads, which rivers ran uh, when they went underground, uh, where you know the fields were when they started to become houses, and you really have the sense of this organic growth thing, and you're in the middle of it, and um, it feels alive. So I can highly recommend that. Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a deep, deep sort of London insider, like London is in his blood. Uh, uh, do, uh, do we have any sense of like, a, like a, an outsider voice of London or someone who is sort of from the, the fringes looking in uh, um, of writers or authors? I mean, writer or books? I mean, the only, th I mean, I'm sure there must be, my mind's gone completely blank. I, the only really, but of course, I mean, there's Naipaul writing about. Uh, London in chapters of books which are also about other places. Uh, I mean, some of my favorite, like, like, like Mimic Men, uh, the, the boarding house, the description yeah. of the boarding house where people land up in the, is it the 60s he's writing about? Uh, and, and, uh, and, and late also, 50s. Late 50s. And then also finding the center, the first half, where he talks about how he began to write when he was working for the BBC is an outsider's view of London, and uh, I haven't, I've read few more compelling about, about being in, in, in a place like that. I would also add a uh, memoir by, uh, by Dan Jacobson, the South African novelist, called, I think it's called Time and Time Again, or Time After Time, I, I can't rem remember now, uh, is a brilliant, I think that's one of the best outsider's views of London, of somebody who really wanted to move there and really wanted to integrate and finding himself, and had read a great deal about it, and, and finding himself mm, initially unable mm -hmm. to integrate, but yet sort of um, full of wonder about, about the city in a way I certainly didn't have when I first moved there. So uh, yeah, I, I mean, I would say Dan Jacobson's book, Time and Time Again. Can I just add something com in relation to what you were asking earlier about the city, and, and just say that you know, um, I mean, talking about the immigrants and, and, and immigrants in the center of London and the immigrants who form part of uh, London's life and, and have in the last 30 or 40 years. You know, when I, when I went there in the early 80s, it was the Ugandan kind of uh, refugees who really, I mean, who, who, who went there and, and mainly the Patels who created the shops. And, um, and, and I remember that being, uh, you know, the, 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 the number of people who are not white mm -hmm. uh, creating a kind of kind of sunlight for me in 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 a in an otherwise miserable uh, uh, experience of britain <laughs> uh, and 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 uh, you know um, about the london now in many ways it's a much more pleasant uh, pleasant place because it, it it has it has benefited so much from various kinds of uh, booms and benefited from the rest of England as well. It has taken so much from elsewhere. Uh, all the money goes to London, in a sense. And, and, uh, um, and, and, and it's no surprise in a, 
that, 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 that the city seems to be booming in a way that it wasn't in the 80s. And when you visit it, yes, coffee is available. That, you know, it's, it's there everywhere. And all these kinds of foods are avail available, which weren't, uh, you know, once you remember food in, in England was a joke. Um, and, and so you, you have this kind of multiplicity of, uh, of bourgeois uh, f amenities and experience now. Um, and, and yet, I feel a great sense of unease now when I, when I go to London because the way it's closed down, the way it is meant now for the rich and for, uh, for a particular circle and, and the way the upper classes, the educated classes are also far more insular now than they've ever been in that city. Uh, and um, in the earlier city, yes, it had those kind of contradictions of being bleak and depressing and yet you'd, you'd suddenly meet somebody who was, let's say, from the academy, someone like Carl Miller, uh, founder, editor of the London Review of Books, a man capable of great intellectual generosity, but you know, quite mm, open to all kinds of experience of what m being British meant and on the side of socialism. Now, of course, socialism got, you know, the collapse of the left and, and the way the new labor reinvented itself meant this kind of consensus coming into England uh, and, and which wasn't there earlier, this, this complete consensus. That lack of a consensus in, 70s, in the 70s, of course, led to chaos, trade union-led chaos. But now you have this consensus and you have this kind of bubble world which is not even affected by the crash. I mean, these are the people who survived the crash and who continue to do quite well. You know? So there is that side to all the fun and laughter of London right now. You know? But that, that's exactly the point. I mean, London isn't a fun and laughter. You know, it, it might be superficially a fun and laughter. And, and I, there's a, um, a big, uh, what is it called? The London Eye. What is it? A, Lon um, a wheel where you can, you know, view London. And I, for me, that is always the, the uh, I can't remember when was it put up 10 years ago. And I initially thought, and I, you know, clearly hadn't read the newspapers closely enough. Uh, I, when I saw it the first time, I thought, okay, yeah, that's, it's, I don't know what this is supposed to be. It's, it's along the Thames, right in the middle of the center. It looks like a, a fun fair roundabout, huge and ugly. Um, and uh, yeah, it'll come down in three months. And it's, it took me years, and I'm still amazed that this is supposed to be a permanent <laughs> feature in London. For me, that is the, the sort of, um, symbol for the, the sort of superficial fun and laughter bit. Uh, but underneath it, you have the, the, the struggles. And coming back to your thing about the, the, you know, London is now ruled by the mega rich, for example. Um, they're not living in London. I mean, the, the Saudis who buy the houses, uh, the, the pop stars who buy the house, they buy them, yes, and there is a problem of the fact that they've pushed up the uh, housing prices, that they then don't even live in their own property. So you have a lot of empty houses in London, which are owned by very rich people. Uh, and on the other hand, of course, you, you, we have an increase of homelessness, uh, very disturbing homelessness in uh, uh, homeless people in London. Uh, so there is that, you know, um, incredible uh, unbalance, but yet <laughs> I, I, I feel like I have great hopes in, in the survival instinct of London. And just one thing to, I mean, the, the image which came actually to my mind when you were speaking is um, from Monica Ali's book. I just can't remember the title. Brick Lane. Lane. There we go. Yes. And her novel ends with the uh, protagonist putting a flower pot onto her windowsill, which sort of symbolizes her final arrival and acceptance that she is now in London, a Londoner. And, um, and that also is a, is a beautiful example of, yes, it, it isn't perfect, but we put our flower pots, and we have, all of us in London, I feel, um, there is space for us to put our flower pots. Right, that silenced uh, the gentleman. Uh, no, no. Farouk, did you? Um, you know, I've, uh, I don't know how to arrange flowers at all, <laughs> but uh, uh, taking off from what Amit said, that there were, there were people, intellectuals, who were willing to uh, interact with you, 
just a story about the late Carl Miller, who used to, who you mentioned, he used to be the editor of The Listener. Now, The Listener was a very popular, big magazine. And when I left university, it began with a photographer writing uh, articles for agencies, trying to sell them, trying to, you know, make a, a living as a writer. Um, the, one of the things I came across was that the Beatles were in love with the Maharishi. And uh, we found out, or my photographer partner found out, that they were going to be at the Hyde Park Hotel talking to the Maharishi. And so we lined up outside, and there were hundreds of reporters and whatnot, but I had long hair and a beard and beads, and I was wearing a kurta and jeans. And uh, when George Harrison got out of the car, the police had stopped all the other reporters, but he grabbed hold of my wrist when he saw my, my, my clothes and pulled me in, and I took Andrew, the photographer, with me. And we went, and we were the only reporters at the first meeting between John Paul George and Ringo and the Maharishi, who was sitting on a pedestal talking nonsense. Um, and, you know, they were saying, oh, Maharishi, this, that, and the other, you know, but we... Uh, Got hold of that, and of course I wrote it up. And then I thought, who should I sell this to? And I phoned up Carl Miller, and I got through to the editor of a big newspaper, and he said, "Come and see me." So I gave him the article, and he just looked over it, and he said, "Yes, I'll publish it." I thought, "Wow, you know, uh, I've got thirty pounds for the first time in my life. Never seen so much money." And he published it, and then he called me to a party because I was the only Asian who'd written for his, his beautiful newspaper. It was like that then. I very much doubt it'll happen again. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that world is gone, I think. Uh, uh, um, another sort of city that's, or another London that no longer exists. Uh, uh, um, uh, maybe, I'm not sure how much time we have, if we should open up, up to questions or... Um, but, but we were talking before, at the beginning to, to dump a little bit more on London uh, um, before the panel, Mike and I, about how so much of central London feels like it's become an amusement park for tourists and the rich. Uh, uh, um, and the London I remember, even the crappy London from the 80s, which was horrible, and the even sort of more racist, horrible London of the 70s, uh, uh, um, there was a there was a charm. There was a beauty. There was a, there was a quietness. There was a sense of you could you could walk through this London and, and imagine the history and imagine the past. And, and, and I find that largely gone. I find it just like big, this big flashy people with people going around on on big wheels going wee wee. Uh, and I I'm wondering if you would like you know any of you would like to talk to that or before you. Um, you know when. One thing we mustn't turn this into is how wonderful the 80s and the 70s actually were, sort of a discussion. But it is true that certain things were happening that even in the midst of, of, of all that sort of uh, depressing stuff. One of, one of the things that was happening was this, the fight for multiculturalism, uh, uh, which even the Tories, I think, took on board, in spite of their kind of conflicting laws, virginity, tests, etc. They, they took on board this, this project of multicultural freedom. Um, earlier, before that, I, I suppose in the 60s and 70s, I mean, you've talked about agitation in politics, and, 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 the, and, and the politics which made uh, you know, racism, although it existed, anathema to the, to the educated liberal classes. Uh, and, and people went, who were very confrontational about it, like the anti-Nazi league for instance. There's that history, very, very important history from which other cities can learn, you know. And, and then the, the multicultural project, which, of course, I mean, had its schlocky side, its kitschy, schmaltzy side as well. But it, it meant that, it, it, yes, I mean, in the 80s, even if you were seeing token representation, you were watching on, on TV uh, programs about Indians, Pakistanis, you were doing some of those. Uh, and, and, and even watching Hindi films, which I'd never seen, art house cinema, money call, at 2 o'clock Sunday, on Sunday afternoon on the BBC. Can you imagine that happening anywhere now in, in, in Britain in the early 80s? Um, so there was that happening. Now, uh, it wasn't the BBC, it was Channel 4. 
could have been Channel 4, but it's also BBC2 was doing this. You know, BBC2 had... Uh, Only after uh, we started. Yeah, I'm sure. Of course, Channel 4 was the pioneer. Um, but uh, what we see now is the failure of the multicultural project everywhere. You know, I mean, it's been thrown out of the window for various reasons. Some of them because it was, it was always so utopian uh, that it wasn't radical enough for some people. But on the, on the other hand, it's mainly been thrown out post 9-11 to, to now justify a new kind of insularity. And, and, and the whole idea of English values, way of life, Western civilization has made a comeback into the discussion, as it never did. It, it wasn't a part of Carl Miller's language, our way of life, the West. This keeps coming up now. And, and, and that's only one of the aspects of this kind of new central London you're talking about, you know, which when, when you see versions of cinema are actually even part of the production. Notting Hill was the first film, and there's not a single black or brown person there. Yeah. You know, actually, when you, when you go to London, at least one thing you do see is that the number of brown faces actually outnumber the white faces. And, you know, just before a sale is being announced at a, at a supermarket, the number of women in hijabs kind of gathered over there. It's just astonishing. And you've never seen that in the representations. It's been a sanitization in the last 10 years. And, this, and the return of this rhetoric, multiculturalism has gone. West, England, English values. This has made a comeback. Um, so that, that's what we're seeing now. I don't think it'll last. I, I do think there was a crossover. You've pointed out that although you had these different ghettos in London, there was a crossover. I realized this when I went to New York and spent five months there uh, in, uh, in the early 2000s. And there was much less of a crossover. Like in New York, you could move between Amsterdam Avenue and the Hispanics and go to the <coughs> other side of the street and go to Broadway. There's absolutely no connection between these words. It's a completely different words. I could think of a parallel in London of something that has, was quite so sealed off in spite of being ghettos. So there was a crossover. I think there is probably that even now. But you, you have this. You, what you are looking now at is, is a post-boom, post-Blairite, and even post 9-11 anti-multicultural Britain and London. This is what you're looking at. And it's all fun and games on the, from the outside. I think, um, I don't think you can throw Britain or England and London into one pot. Uh, I think that there is, uh, I mean, for example, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I think London is a very special place. <coughs> and I agree with you, there is, of course, at the moment, this warring rhetoric, uh, very warring rhetoric, since 9-11 and now intensified, especially since uh, last summer's, uh, so to speak, refugee crisis. There is that incredibly worrying uh, rhetoric and also sentiment. Um, but again, especially in London, I don't know for the rest of Britain, and that worries me much more for the rest of Britain. But inside London, I do think, um, there is a uh, back and forth between these arguments. It's, it's not that simple or that easy for a single group, whatever that group may be. So if it's, uh, yeah, if it's the sort of UKIP voters or very conservative voters trying to push into one direction, if you have the um, you know, Islamic fundamentalists trying to push something into another direction, yes, it happens, but there's always, in London, a backlash against it. So that evens out the problem with the rest of the Not Britain. enough, I would say. Not, not compared to... I mean, in, in India, the problem is they're, prof, they're professional left liberal people. They make a career out of being that. I wish there were a few more of them in the world. You know, the, the, the professional left liberals seem to have gone, mainly. Uh, and, and, the, and the left liberal journalists we see do now, un, I mean, with much less questioning, speak about terms like the West being under threat, ways of life being under threat. They, they, they've embraced that. Uh, I, I don't think you would get away with that, let's say, in India, with all its problems. There's much more vigilance from people I don't even like, but are necessary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do we have time to open up the questions? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, we have a microphone, and my microphone's coming. Hello. How do you 
think the uh, immigration from the East European countries is going to affect uh, the culture of London or the Londonness of London? Well, uh, the, the East European uh, immigration has been the latest, uh, the latest bugbear in the, in British politics. The party called UKIP, the United Kingdom Independence Party, has broken from mainly. It started by breaking from the Conservative Party on the issue of the number of East Europeans coming into Britain. On the other hand, the Conservative Party, which represents the capitalists, say that we need Polish plumbers, builders, plasterers, artisans. Recently we had, I, my partner, we had a house uh, expansion of the kitchen uh, into a room half the size, say. And um, it was uh, an enterprise undertaken by a British firm. But over the four months that it took to build, I didn't see one English person or British person turning up to lay the cement, to put up the pillars, to uh, you know do whatever was necessary. They were all Poles, all Hungarians, all Bulgarians, or whoever. One or two Cypriots thrown in, and so that has become. But they all attempted to speak English because they were Europeans. If you had people, shall we say, from the subcontinent, uh, workers in mills in Bradford or Dewsbury or uh, Huddersfield, they wouldn't bother to learn English. They were quite content to live in their ghettos. The uh, uh, Polish immigrants, for instance, who are the largest number, are attempting to integrate, and they really are a necessary part of London. If you go to any bar or any hotel, the people serving you will not be English. They'll be Eastern European. And I think that actually they have already, I mean, Eastern Europeans have started to integrate because we've seen that they, they are the right for over the last, yeah, 10 years. Um, so, you know, um, I think they are now, especially in London again, and I'm making that distinction between Britain and London, they are an integral <laughs> part. Actually, I was, as you were talking, I suddenly had this, um, and I think this is quite a good uh, uh, example of uh, Britain, my, my father-in-law, my late father-in-law, uh, who really still belonged to the old colonial Britain in some ways. Um, he, uh, yes, he, he made, you know, racist comments against Germans, against, you know, anyone. Um, his two sons, both, married foreigners. And um, yes, he made racist comments. I mean, the, his, his major joke was, well, if you tell Germans to walk, they will even walk over a, a cliff. And he would say that right, you know, in, in my face. And I, I just realized, as long as I just pretend I haven't heard it, um, you know, we actually coexist quite happily. You know, he, and he, um, yeah, so he, he had to accept that both his sons married foreigners. Um, he, he wasn't happy about it, but he accepted it. And he actually was ultimately a very nice man. And that for me is always somehow, uh, and uh, shows the ability of the British and also especially Londoners to somehow accept and eventually embrace, not necessarily always, you know, lovingly at first, but yeah, to, to integrate something into their system. Uh, do we have any other questions? enjoyed it very much, but uh, I didn't realize it was going to be about London as a, an, an urban entity and not as, um, I would say, um, a metaphor, like London um, as an imagined space 
that is used in, in, in fiction, what a city, what even London might be like as a character. I just come from a, a session called Calcutta, Kunal Das is a book named Calcutta, and we were, they were discussing about how the, um, there are so many, there's Calcutta, there's Kolkata, there is um, Cali, I suppose, many versions of the same city. And I was hoping to perhaps hear from uh, the writers, of course, the one uh, writer I've read most is, is Amin, and his uh, many versions of, uh, I suppose, um, the Kolkata that, that he identifies with, um, or even Bombay, which he writes about, which perhaps is not Mumbai, but the Bombay of his childhood. And um, so um, even Dhaka for us, you know, the, the Dhaka spelled with an H and the one with the T-A-C-C-A that we grew up with had different connotations. And I was hoping that um, there would be some, um, you know, uh, literary discussion about uh, London as it has been in fiction, um, or how it has influenced maybe your readings or your writings, um, the, the, the different Londons as an imagined space, that was <laughs> I mean, sorry, it became kind of slagging off the London session, uh, slightly. But, but um, uh, towards the beginning, I don't know if you were here, we did talk a little bit about uh, the literary kind of thing. <laughs> Not very much. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I've written this book about London. I, I never I imagined I would want to write a book about London. Uh, so let me let me say that London is, is, as I hinted earlier, is a city in which I began to realize what it is I wanted to write about, but in this negative, antithetical way. So London was not the city I wanted to write about. Let me tell you a little bit about the aspects of London that form my, my kind of idea of what to me was interesting in writing. The, the, the experience of London I had, first and foremost, once I entered my room, uh, and this could be true of other parts of England as well, but for me it was London as an undergraduate, was silence. So I could, I could actually hear the silence in the room, and, I, and even now, when I go back to England, one of the first things I encounter there is silence. So uh, you, you uh, enter the room, or whatever, and there is such a silence there that you don't have, let's say, in South Asia, in, in India, definitely. definitely. Um, lifting the window would let in a bit of noise or sound from, from the street. Um, so I'm talking now about what formed me as a writer and made me realize that these things were important to me as important as literature was, which I wasn't that good to study, informing me. Um, so lifting the, the window would, would let in some noise, but the thing about Warren Street where I was staying is of course that is, is, is or in many parts of London, is that people are always going somewhere. Nobody loitered, partly because except in the summer, it was too, too cold uh, to, to really hang out on the street and do nothing over there. So one aspect of life in which, as let's say Walter Benjamin says of Paris, there's certain kind of spaces which are neither interior nor exterior, like the arcades, become for the modern man a place to loiter, to do nothing. Those seem to be absent in the London that I was encountering. So uh, I would lift the window, I would look out at Tandoor Mahal, an Indian restaurant, that was interesting to me. But, uh, but the people were all going to the tube station, Warren Street tube station, coming out and going somewhere to an office. And that, that was it. Then there wasn't much happening there. At that time, I remember also reading Naipaul, writing in, in a collection of essays called The Overcrowded Barracoon, uh, something about Trinidad. Uh, he talks about the fact that the, the tropical climate makes it possible for people to lead half their lives out in the open. So it is possible to actually see how people, in a sense, lead their lives, what they do, in the way they gather and disappear and come together at certain points on the street. Um, 
gradually I began to become aware that this kind of commerce between the inside and the outside represented also in movement. Movement in which uh, the street begins to be owned as if it were an extension of the interior by people. And that you somehow from the interior uh, suddenly partake of it. You too become part of the street but have your own space to yourself. That these things were important to me as a writer and a writer of the city. And London alerted me to this by being the complete opposite. Uh, so I would, and once I would bring down the window, there would be silence. Silence would reassert itself. One of the great moments of, you know, what, revelatory moments for me was going back to India and being, you know, suddenly aware that one could never have that perfect solitude. Uh, one was always distracted. One was always impacted by what one couldn't see because noises would be coming from another street. The, 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 the soundtracks of Shotojit Rai are all, all about what's happening and also what's happening elsewhere, what you cannot see, what is not part of the frame of action. So I realized that um, what is not part of the frame of action is very important to me. I couldn't have understood the value of those things if I hadn't been in London and in the London that I knew as in the early 80s, completely terrified by only being aware of what's in the frame of action. Me, in the room, doing something cut off from the street. Never the center. Always alone with myself. And in a way, this is what the book is about. I'm sorry, I couldn't talk a bit more about that. Thank you. I think we've um, come to the out before that. Yeah. Um, let me try and answer your question in a different way for a moment. Uh, when one reads about Shakespeare's love, you can see there that it's full of palaces and the court. It's full of intrigues of the palaces and the court. There are the prisons, there is the tower. Then there are Falstaff's pubs where he goes and there's a revelry in the streets. And there are some common people, but you don't get a complete view of London at all. You get a view of, of, of the courts, the intrigues, and so forth. When you come to Dickens's London, skipping a few centuries, you again find uh, what has happened in London, of course, is that capitalism has impacted on the city and has disrupted the feudal structure, but yet you won't find even though Dickens worked as a boy in a, in a blacking factory, you won't find a description of capitalist work, of labor at all. What you find is Fagin and Oliver Twist being pulled into a den of crooks. Uh, you find the gentry who live in, uh, who adopt Oliver later, or David Copperfield's people, you find the schools and the cruelty there, you find the workhouses, you find Martian Sea Prison, you find the madhouses, you find the prisons, uh, you, you get a feeling of London, which is very, very real, but you don't get this idea that manufacturing has, in some sense, changed this whole landscape. Again, I would characterize it as the sort of settlement that one finds, shall we say, in feudal India. Um, you know, Shakespeare with the Mughal courts, and um, later on you take a, a, a village settlement, and the Thakur, the landlord is there, and then there's uh, other castes, and people know exactly their position in society. It's sort of analogous to that. When you come to modern London, it has become a classical melting pot. All sorts of people are doing all sorts of different things there. And therefore, when I started writing about London, I was just counting as you, as, as you asked the question, I've probably written about four, five series about London, you know, no problem. It's a comedy about West Indians, about West Indian kids, a series about that. Uh, Tandoori Nights about, uh, for the BBC, about two rival restaurants run by Indians, completely different from the no problem, not impacting on it at all, a different kind of thing. King of the Ghetto, 
about uh, the facilities of the East End of London and the intrigue and drama that goes on there. Uh, Come to Mecca, a series of short stories set in uh, with young people, with teenagers and workers in schools and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, thinking of the television and the books, one comes to London not as a metaphor for a city, but as a melting pot of very, very separate different sections about who you can write fiction. And of course, there are integrative books, as, as she mentioned, Peter Ackroyd, but that is a history of the city itself, of the bricks and mortar, rather than of the people. And I've only written about the people. Well, one's closing one sentence. Um, just coming back to the imaginative space, I think what you've actually seen here uh, is, is um, the exploration. We're trying to, we actually show you how we deal with London as an imaginative space. Because London, we can't pin down London to a number of, of descriptive words. And I think that's what makes London exciting. That's why we all, in our different ways, actually, we're continuously responding to London and it has influenced us. So in some ways, you saw imagination in the process. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. Thank you all for coming.